Welcome to Philadelphia University's Roxborough Roundtable Talks. This episode features Professor Raju Parker. Welcome everybody to the Roxborough Roundtable number one. My name is uh, Raju Parker. I am the Assistant Professor of International Relations and I'm sponsoring this topic which is the West sanctions on Russia will it lead to Cold War 2.0. And uh, we have a few fellow faculty and uh, one student who is, two students, I'm sorry, two students joining us for uh, this uh, roundtable discussion. So let me go and uh, let's start with uh, Chris over here. And Chris, would you mind giving a, a quick introduction to yourself? Uh, my name is Chris Farmer. I'm a second year architecture major here at Philly U. And I'm with uh, Professor Parkow's uh, global politics class. I'm Dylan Formley. I'm a first year Law Society major. Uh, that's a, that's my intro. I think there's three students then: one in architecture and two in Law Society. Ooh, one. She's here. She's My name is Evan Lane. I'm the director of Law Society. I'm also the faculty director of the All Inspector Center for Public Service. Uh, my name is Tom Strand. I'm the associate dean for general education. And I'm a professor of history in the School of Science Health, the College of Science Health and Liberal Arts. Thank you, everyone, for the quick introductions. Uh, to continue with the topic, uh, let me ask all of you to give an opening statement on this issue. It can be anything that you think about it, or if you have a question about it, whatever comes to your mind. Like 30 seconds, you can take 30 seconds to give your initial thoughts on this, and then from then, our plan is that uh, based on that and based on a few other questions that we have, we will continue uh, discussing the different ramifications and different sides of this issue. So, let me come back to you, Chris, and give you the first opportunity to give an opening statement. Like I said, it can be anything that comes to your mind on this issue. It could be a question, it could be a statement, whatever. But uh, Let's all stay away at this point from answering the main question whether this will lead to a World War 2.0. We'll take that up at the very end. So, Chris? Uh, when I first heard about this topic, I knew a little bit about it and I did obviously a little more research. Uh, and what my research kind of drove me towards was not necessarily if we're at the edge of Cold War 2.0, but rather if it's just a uh, way of warfare is changing and whether it should be really called Cold War 2.0 if that's where we're headed or if it should just be called another war because of the way technology is changing and the times that we're experiencing. Um, I don't, I'm kind of a novice in this group. Uh, I didn't follow it too closely, I've only read briefly, but um, you know, I, from what I've seen of it, what I've read of it, it just seems that there's a uh, it's almost like a, a struggle for power in Russia between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine is trying to keep their, or Russia is trying to keep an asset, and uh, it just seems like the United States is trying to just throw themselves in there for the pot and play their normal role of protector, and it's kind of just nonsense. I don't know much. <laughs> I'll, I'll build on that. So what I'm particularly interested in this is in the press, media, and so forth, we get the story, the usual story, that our opponent's crazy, an aggressor, out of control, no reason for what they're doing other than an uncontrolled ego. But actually, this is a very complicated matter. Um, Putin does have reasons for doing what he's done. The United States has been involved, NATO has been involved, and the situation is far more complicated. And the usual role that the U.S. plays in its press and so forth of being the innocent victim of a crazy dictator is not the full story here, and I would like to explore that as well. The U.S. role in bringing this about. Um, my my training is in uh, Russian history. I, I'm not an expert on contemporary Russia, and uh, know even less about contemporary Ukraine. But I, I kind of see this situation as, as an embarrassment to uh, the Western liberal powers and to NATO that um, Putin can do what he's doing and maneuver the way that he's doing uh, and essentially invade another country without us even being able to call it an invasion. 
I think he's very wily and cunning. I, I don't think he's insane. I think he's very strategic. But I think he's using our democratic values and our coalition building, you know, as a weapon against us to to get with, to push us to the edge, get, try to get as much leverage as he can uh, without provoking an all-out war. Uh, my final turn is mine. So, as a scholar who looks at this from a historical perspective, my biggest interest, apart from answering that big question that we have as the debate topic, is to also look at the history of this development. Like, why did things come to this pass? Because in 1990, when uh, World War 1.0, as you know, some of us, especially me, call it, ended, we all thought that it was the uh, beginning of a new liberal phase. But uh, these events, especially what's been happening in the last six, seven months, have completely changed their understanding of the, the new uh, world order that happened. What would you mean by new liberal phase? Is that something? Yeah, so uh, that is in 1990-91 when the Soviet Union dis got dismantled and uh, the new leadership in Russia became more too much closer to the West. They adopted, for example, free markets. They adopted democracy. So free markets and democracy are what is understood as parts of the liberal world order. By liberal, I don't mean in the American sense of liberal. I mean in the classical European sense of the word liberal. Open-minded, so democracy, you know, much more open. People elect their leaders, unlike what happened, which happened in the Soviet Union past. And, uh, and free markets, so it's much more open. It's not the government who decides what's the price. But, and we thought, as somebody famously wrote a book in the early 90s, the end of history. That means there's no more history happening. It's all, it's all going to be nice. But it's that, is, that is such an example, though, of um, American centrism and that everything somehow revolves around us. That was completely wrong. Yeah. Russia was Russia. Yes. And it was Russian influence and Eastern influence. And when it ended, it's not like they lost, we won. It was an agreement on both sides, actually. Yeah. So it was best for both to cooperate. But suddenly we see, ah, they're going to be Americanized. And somehow that this liberal thought you had, they're going to be Americanized and they're going to be eating apple pie and they're going to do all the things that we do. No, they were doing Russian things. They yeah. were nowhere near a democracy. And they they were oligarchy at the beginning, and somehow we think that they're part of us, and that was the mistake we made from the beginning. And we make that mistake all the time and everywhere, including in Iraq in 2003, when we thought that once we took away Saddam Hussein and we put a new order in, it's going to be a, a mirror image of the United States. Not exactly the same, but somewhat of the best you can get in that part of the world. Because only our system works. Well, it's not, it's not just the US. I mean, the, the model would be any Western European democracy. Exactly. And, and some of the former you know, republics of the Soviet Union went on to become fairly successful, stable, free nations. That's actually a very strong so, argument. Uh, it's not out of the question for Russia to have done it. It wasn't likely, but it wasn't yeah. out of the question. There were some indications they were, you know, they moved that way economically. And politically, were less successful opening up, but did have free elections and had you know, have a parliament. Um, and they've just been taken over yeah. by oligarchs and by you know, by Putin. Um, but it's, I don't see us. And I do think we won the Cold War. I think the Soviet Union clearly lost. <laughs> their whole system collapsed. They lost all their. They lost their allies. They lost the republics. So everything fell apart. Um, and but see, the problem is when we view it that way. Yeah. And as typically going through history, to the victor goes the spoils. And but suddenly, we, we own this area. And no, we, we pushed. We push. Georgia, we pushed in the different, different uh, city-states where they were. We pushed there. And we keep on pushing at them, thinking that what well, we want, our system should dominate. And what do we expect Putin to do in response to our pushing in the Ukraine, in Georgia, other territories, what do we expect them to sit back and say that's fine? Uh, we, no, we shouldn't expect that, but what are we supposed to do as, as good you know, liberal Democrats except to promote our values and expect other people to embrace them? And it's not like we're forcing you know, Georgia or Estonia or Latvia or any of these other republics or former Soviet territories into the EU. 
they want to go to the EU. The, the riots in Ukraine were because people thought they were going to join the EU, and then they didn't, and they hated that. So, you know, they they have their own aspirations, and maybe we were maybe we shouldn't encourage them. Maybe we should back off of them. Yeah, there is something that is, yeah, there's a desperate yeah. When you for Chris, yeah. when you read the papers, okay, on this, how do you feel it's being portrayed? Do you think it's been portrayed fairly? Do you, are you understanding? Putin's motives, our motives, or the history of this. What are you getting out of it? What are you doing after that? I think because the way I've been following this was, yeah, reading some American papers, but I've also been looking at some papers overseas and seeing how they portray it. And from what I've gathered, it's been kind of a fair situation in my eyes, what's been going on between, uh, in my eyes at least, Putin isn't really doing anything too bad. Like the worst thing I can do that he did in this case was stand there and say, "Vote. Do you want to be part of Russia?" And he didn't pull his troops out. He left the troops there and started occupying them. And obviously, they're going to vote favor joining Russia if you have a Russian soldier standing there. And so, in my eyes, I think it's a case where U.S. is overstepping their boundaries. But uh, I kind of see both sides because of the way I particularly read about it. Your own research. Yes. From what I've seen on the news, and again, having not really followed it too in depth, uh, it seems that we're trying to do what we always do and step in and control and um, try and westernize and Americanize anything that we deem is not all right. Um, we're trying to be that safeguard again. Um, and it just seems that this is something between Ukraine and Russia, and we have no business in it, but still we're trying to, it, it just, uh, 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 okay. Yeah, I mean, you said something, I want to branch off that. Uh, to me, it's not, uh, this is not about Ukraine, although we think it's about Ukraine. This is, to a certain extent, about, the way I see it, two things. One, and this again goes back to what Tom said. Russia's inability to be a liberal democracy uh, and to be a participant in the liberal world. Uh, and as Tom said, you know, there were other republics, like for example Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all those countries that came out of the whole 15 Soviet republics and they went into became amazingly great uh, EU participants, great liberal democracies. So this is a bit of Russia not becoming a uh, liberal democracy and there are no internal issues with that, especially with the rise of Putin himself. Why yeah. would we ever reasonably expect a country with no history at all of democracy, coming from um, one oppressive regime to the other, whether it was the Tsar or it was the Communist Party, all of a sudden to wake up one day and go, oh, we're, we're a democracy, but we're the only a democracy here. No, it is not the, it. Like I said, there are other republics that were part of the Soviet Union that had that had the exact same history, but well, they successfully transferred uh, to a new, new model. Well, the most successful ones did have a history of democracy. So the, the Baltic states, Latvia, the three. Yes, yeah, they were different from they, Russia. Yeah, they were yeah. brought in late, and they were very different, and had all different. That's true. And culture. So yeah, we shouldn't be too surprised that Russia did make that transition. But every country that's a democracy now, at one point, was a dictatorship. Eventually, countries, you know, France was a oh, yeah. <laughs> aristocracy, and they eventually became a democracy. Yeah, so, so it can't happen. It's it can't happen. But, um, but again, I go back to what I was saying. Uh, my two reasons why the, the, the way I see this conflict, it is, uh, uh, it is not. And I say it's not about Ukraine. It's about a Russia's inability to become a liberal democracy and become be part of the whole liberal world. The other one is our inability to understand that when we get closer and closer to Russia, we are making Putin madder and madder. And I think, so you know, when you said we, NATO, 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 NATO. Just, let's do a thought experiment. Let's do a thought experiment. What if China started getting very close to Mexico and other countries close to us, Cuba or Canada, you think about it. Well, how would we feel about it? We have the perfect example when the Soviet Union is the close to Cuba. We're still freaked out. Yeah. Cuba. We still don't even have a relationship with that country, yeah. which is another topic for another time. Exactly. Look how, look how we've reacted. That's when my, my point exactly. My point exactly. So uh, I want to know how others feel about that particular line of thinking that 
A, this is not necessarily entirely about Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is so unlucky to be in that particular <laughs> spot and being in the wrong place at the wrong time <laughs> with the wrong people. <laughs> so, um, but if you want to branch off into something, like, um, I know maybe Tom has a different take on that. No, I'm just thinking about your, your thought experiment and what if what if it wasn't Russia and Ukraine? I mean, what strikes me is that we've got one sovereign country undermining and you know kind of secretly invading another one. Um, is that okay? Can we just so if it wasn't Russia and Ukraine, we don't have a we don't have a close relationship with Ukraine necessarily. We don't have we don't have a military alliance. So yes, no reason for us to jump in. So you them. condemn a country invading. We had some. The English word is chutzpah, okay? And chutzpah is uh, the definition of chutzpah is that somebody kills their parents and pleads for the mercy of the court that he's now an orphan, okay? That's chutzpah. The United States, after invading Iraq, oh, not too long ago, which has led to, and you can tie in what's going on now to that as well. How do we have the moral or, or ethical authority? Just turn to Russia and go, what you're doing is wrong. Oh, I think anyone can tell anyone what to do is wrong. Whether they have moral authority or not. Uh, but no, I think the Iraq invasion was an illegal invasion. I think the world community should have punished us for that, just like we're trying to punish, um, except we're too big, they're scared to punish us. Just like we're scared to punish Russia too, too strictly because of the repercussions. Um, but yeah, is it okay? Is what's happening okay just in, in the abstract? This. One country. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Should we even care? Because it, is it within our interests? All right, this is happening. So, yeah. well, so we, that, should we go ahead? Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. You uh, said like we're hard, we're like being tended to punish them too strictly. Why didn't dip our toe in the water? Why didn't start? Yeah. Why did? Why are we going to even start giving them any tariffs or anything like that? Why not just stay out? Just why? completely stay out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because probably, I mean, I'm, 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 my guess would be that um, then it just emboldens them to go further. And, you know, we very quickly get into the Hitler analogy of, you know, letting, you know, he does one little thing and we say, okay. Well, Hitler, Hitler with Hitler. Hitler. Yeah, Hitler with <laughs> dictators everywhere. Um, so, yeah, where, do, you, you know, do you appease or do you take a hard line and, and deter them from taking further aggression? So, so I think this is where the fine line we're trying to walk. If he if he lets he sees he gets away with this, then he'll try the next thing. If he gets away with that, he'll try the next thing. And where when when do you when do you draw the line? Like with Hitler, in retrospect, if we'd taken a firmer stand earlier, you know maybe we could have nipped that. You know I can see this argument going on somewhere in the East, saying you know George Bush, he was just like Hitler. He invaded <laughs> Afghanistan. He invaded uh, um, Kuwait, Iraq. All these things. It it all depends on what side you're looking yeah. at. Absolutely. So we've, we have done all of this, but because it's us, it's right. No, I don't think it's right. I think it's wrong, and we do it too. And the world has the right to condemn us and sanction us, whatever they want to do. Uh, in some cases, they do that. In some cases, they're you know, intimidated to do it. So, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm definitely not defending our foreign policy uh, or our invasions. Uh, some of our invasions have been sanctioned by... International and organization, that nation has approved them yet. Yeah. Some they have. So those, Some they have. Those I consider out of line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, also to answer that, to, to like answer your, your question, uh, it, it's largely what Tom said that you, know, you don't want it to be uh, something that countries can get away with. That you invade another country and then you can get away with it. And it's also a lot more than that. Uh, like I always said in my global politics classes all the time. The Cold War is over, the Soviet Union is gone, but Russia is still around. So let's not kid ourselves that we have completely turned a new page. We could have, but we didn't. And the other way of looking at this would be that it's not a Cold War 2.0, but it's just an extension of Cold War 1.0. <laughs> we thought that it ended, whereas in the minds of people like Putin, it never ended. In fact, if you read his, what he's been, he's a very difficult man to understand, but if you try to understand, uh, if you try to, if you, if you get some information from about what he's thinking, especially in the Kremlin, which is their, uh, like their White House, he is not thinking about the Soviet era. He's thinking about the czarist hundred years ago era. He sees himself as the person who brought back Russia into that 
prime time. He wants history to see him like that. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a yeah, story. So this what is, was historically the relationship between Kiev, Ukraine, Moscow? What, what's that? Yeah, I mean, it's really complicated. I'm, I'm not an expert on that area because it's a very contested area that's traded hands back and forth. So the borders have been redrawn many, many times. times. So, but kind of the origins of what's now the Russian people is, is kind of in Kiev, in Kiev and Rus, which is kind of a place where Russian culture was born. So, yeah, there's a very, that area, and it's, right now there's a lot of Russian speakers in the eastern part of Ukraine. People who ethnically, culturally feel themselves to be Russian, even if they're living in Ukraine. And they all used to be in the same country, the Soviet Union. So when the Ukraine books broke off, it took this large Russian population with them. Um, you know, just like Czechoslovakia took a German population with them in, in, in their borders. Um, so that's, I mean, I think what Raju's saying is really, on point, Putin is a Russian nationalist, I think. He doesn't want to recreate the Soviet Union, but had all these other ethnic groups that have never really got along and got integrated. But he wants all the Russian people yeah. in, in one territory, and he sees yeah. them over in Ukraine, he sees them in exactly. Ukraine, he sees them in a few other places. So he sees Russian people, part of his nationalist point of view, yeah, I think yeah. being pushed by Western forces to be separated from Russia. Well, there's that, but I think, I think he also wants to protect Russia. So he wants a buffer zone between Russia and its traditional enemies like Germany. So you think the, the United States, States were to back out right now and <coughs> like make the, lower the tensions between Ukraine mm -hmm. and Russia? I, I feel like um, Russia is kind of pushing maybe a little bit harder just because of our presence. Because you're right, it's an extension of the Cold War. It's kind of, especially with Putin, Putin who thinks. It's the whole czar's thing. He shows his power, Iron Fist, and I think that with the United States presence there, it's making him push a little harder. And it's kind of, I don't know, I, I just feel... The U.S. Uh, does not have troops, in, because Ukraine is not part of NATO, so the U.S. does not have troops there. The closest we have troops is in Romania, which is a NATO member. Did they decide to, What's that? Did they decide to send troops in? Oh no, that would be no, war. Be, be that, war. Would be war. <laughs> that would be war. That would be war, yeah. We haven't done that. That's okay. This is the question that yeah, yeah. helpful. So yeah, so the closest we have is Romania, uh, where it is a NATO member. And that's kind of the 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 if you want to talk about it, you know, that's Putin's beef. <laughs> that we have countries like Romania which were part of the Soviet satellite states, part of NATO now. And so he's lost that to to, to go back to what Tom was saying, he's lost that buffer. They have lost their buffer. Dylan is a really good point, though, because we talk about economic sanctions. Being yeah. Something we're doing. Yeah. Ramping up the tensions. That's what you're saying. You know, yeah. We don't have troops that go but The economic. Would, if looking for a solution to this, I know it's so typically un American to back off because that would be a sign of weakness. But are we, by these economic sanctions, actually ramping up and making a sort of a. Uh, I use the word war between Putin and Obama, where it becomes a power ego situation. And by entering in, we might have thrown flame on a situation, uh, or gas on a flame, instead of uh, put it out. That's what you're saying. I like that. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah. To talk to that point, you mentioned the liberal free. Yeah, the liberal order. The yeah. free idea. Yeah. And a lot of American companies have to get advantage of that. And you know, got a lot of business in Russia. These economic sanctions are putting more stress on our economy as an effect because those companies aren't getting the funds from Russia, funds, you know, but uh, the profit from Russia as they would have been because their products can't be sold in Russia because of the tariffs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to go off your point, I think the U.S. knows what they're doing when they are trying to put the pressure on them because they don't want to hurt our economy, especially in the current state it's in. But I don't know if there would be another route because I feel like we do have to do something about it. Not like I said, I'm not going to defend our foreign policy of going to other countries. But I do think someone needs to step in and say, "Hey, you can't do this. They're a sovereign nation. You can't just go in there." It's kind of ironic. It's us in this case. We like to break, make our own rules, and break them like us. <laughs> but uh, that's where I stand with that. Just a point of what you're saying. That's why we should be very careful. Yeah. 
in our foreign policy, because when we do things like we did in Iraq, it takes away the power of the, of the world. If we come out and say, what you said, it's wrong to invade foreign countries. And if we never invaded foreign countries, then we'd have some moral backing, authority. But it's almost, I think people in different countries hear that coming from our president, our president think it's laughable. Yeah. And I think that's where some of Putin's actions and aggression comes from, because he's like, oh, I'm not going to listen to you because of what we did. So I think, you know, you can't change history now. But had we not done what we did in Iraq and those other countries, I don't think Putin would be pushing back as hard as he is. And I don't back to your point about the aggression. Um, if I can play devil's advocate a bit here on that, uh, we really used, you, none of you, none of us used the word hypocrisy with that, you know. With, <laughs> but uh, you know, when it comes to the U.S. foreign policy, then, you know, uh, we make the laws and make the rules and we break them. But here's the thing: it is the sign of a superpower that it can be hypocritical in its foreign policy. Only superpowers can do that. That is our superpower. That is our superpower. <laughs> <laughs> it all started with Jefferson. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we were not hypocritical in our foreign policy, uh, we, in a sense, are not satisfying the checkboxes of being a superpower. Because that is the ultimate sign of superpower, that you can be hypocritical. To and world. the world will accept it. And, and, and being a superpower also means that the world comes to us when... They want when something yes. has to be fixed. Exactly. Like, you know, they're being mean to us. <laughs> they to come help us and fix it. And that's, you know, so that's kind of what the world's looking to us now to yeah. do. And because we don't have, you know, Ukraine is not the strategic, necessarily strategic yeah. ally for us. So we don't have a lot at stake. In fact, the sanctions are easier for us because we have less ties with Russia. It's really hard on the European countries who are much yeah. more integrated with yeah. Russia's economy. But I had a question about that. Uh, not to bring up Sudan, but we didn't. What was our involvement in Sudan? Did we really have an involvement when the two countries decide to divide? Oh. Sudan? I don't follow it. Sudan or? Yeah, because now there's uh, north and south of the uh, Sudan, rather. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, we didn't, we didn't really have involvement there. And so the point that I'm going to lead to is uh, if we didn't involve there and they were able to divide themselves by themselves, why couldn't Ukraine, if they really felt divided? Oh, okay, I know you want to be part of Russia. Right. Why couldn't they have just divide themselves without our interference? Right. Well, I mean, I think it's a little different because like, Sudan was a civil war, so it's, a, yeah. it's one country splitting into two, or this is Russia coming in to Ukraine and taking well, a piece of the uh, Crimea did have a vote whether or not they wanted to become part of um, Russia. That, that's, yeah, yeah, that was yeah, another that, issue. The, no, that vote <laughs> was such a, back in March. Uh, the more you read about that vote, and before the vote was counted, everybody knew that what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that was just a formality, but we all knew what was going to happen. So, um, but they have done polls in Ukraine. Yeah, and there are certain areas, depending on where you are, where the Russian speakers are, overwhelmingly. Yeah, want to be part of the so uh, part of Russia. Russia. Yeah. So why not? Why why are we stepping in there and interfering with the internal politics of other countries when it doesn't have any effect on us? I mean, there was a security risk in the United States of some kind. Uh, so, but there's not. And the Ukraine is a bankrupt country. I mean, let's not forget the incredible um, corruption in that country. Who wants, to be, who wants to be involved in that anyway? It's almost like a gift. You know, Russia, you want this mess? Go ahead. Go ahead. Take it. Why does it involve us? They want it. The people want it. Why are we involved? Uh, it's called uh, it's, it's a part of you know, um, social scientific or signaling. Signal, we are signaling to the world that we are weak, that we cannot handle a bullet. So uh, we might think that, oh, not getting involved in that would save our soldiers' lives, but in the long run, what we are signaling to the rest of the world is we are willing to put up with a quote unquote bully. And uh, that's not good if you are a strong alliance like NATO, and especially because Ukraine has interest to be part of NATO and be part of the uh, European Union. And uh, that's very terrifying for Putin. So Ukraine, for again, I go back to what I said before, is just caught in the middle, caught in the crossfire. And, uh, uh, and so Ukraine has become emblematic of two alliances, or one alliance in one country, fighting over who is more superior, whose world runs the world. What do you guys think that what Professor Parikel said of the whole thing that we have to say about 
somehow the police in the world to do this uh, responsibility. I, I think that the United States thinks that we are the police of the world. We, we, we generally believe that it's our role in the world to keep everyone else in line. And we have time and time again overstepped our boundaries. We do it all the time. It's one of our trademarks. Yeah, so if you ask people in the Middle East and in South Asia, they would say, the U.S. is the bully. Yeah. So the term bully is very subjective. Like who, you, who, who you ask is going to determine who is the bully in the world. Um, yeah. So, you know the ultimate joke of all this is? By us pushing the data, we force Putin to do this. And in Putin doing what he's doing, He's strengthening NATO because now all the NATO countries are coming together, and both sides are get, not getting what they want. Yeah, and the, it's, it's it's almost and, laughable. And it's the same with the sanctions. We it's more than that, yeah. yeah, he does something aggressive. We put sanctions. He wants us. He <laughs> he wants some leverage to get us to take the sanctions down. So he does something more. It takes even more territory. And we put it more. You know, it's like this ratcheting yeah. where both sides are committing deeper and deeper to get mm-hmm. leverage on the other. The, the, the sanctions are actually uh, a first line of defense in this case, or offense in this case. <laughs> um, and there are two lines of the, uh, two lines of two pieces of news that uh, are coming out of Russia. One line which says sanctions are not doing anything to Russia or anything to Putin. The other line is saying sanctions is keeping Russian economy uh, in a recession. Russian economy grew by just around one percent. It was growing around four to five percent before the sanctions hit. So, and they have been ratcheting, we have been ratcheting up the sanctions. Uh, the sanctions are very targeted, extremely targeted on the close aids of Putin and some of the key sectors of the Russian economy. So it's not like how we put sanctions on Cuba, where it was a blanket sanction and the people who really suffer the Cuban people. This one is a little more thoughtful and I would say that it is having an effect on those people, but it is a thing. Uh, they can survive with those sanctions. If we think that the sanctions are going to make Putin or the Russian people turn around and say, yes, we surrender, it's not going to happen. If anything, Putin's popularity in Russia has only gone up. Yeah. Going back to what you just said, instead of uh, bringing things down, our yeah. rhetoric has increased the opposition to us, yes. and his rhetoric has increased the opposition to him. Yeah. So where's the solution in all this? Uh, just to go back to what I said at the beginning, we actually had wonderful relations with Putin because it, when we attacked, when we went after Al Qaeda after 9 11, Putin allowed us to fly over Russian airspace. Putin allowed us to use Russian uh, ground space, everything to transport stuff. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not a, in favor or against President Obama, uh, but I think. There has been a bit of a downturn in the U.S.-Russian relations after, uh, you know, after the new administration took over in 2008, and uh, there has not been people leader to leader contact is very important, and that has just broken down between Obama uh, and Putin. The Georgia thing happened on the push, though, right? Uh, just around the time when it was changing. So, because my reading of it, correct me if I'm wrong, is yeah. that actually it was very good on the push. And yes. then it sunk, sunk. Yep. really bad towards the end, yep. really bad. And when, when Obama came, he called for a reset. He called it the relationship. And then it rose up again. Yeah. And then Congress got involved. Yeah. They finally passed something, which is which they <laughs> avoided passing something, which sanctioned Russia for civil rights, which I always think is lovely when this country talks to other countries about civil rights violations. This is a country in World War II where we wouldn't allow blacks to fight with whites. We're talking about civil rights around the world. So we got involved in their internal politics again, stupidly. Yeah. And that brought it down. But the point I'm saying that is he is amenable to discussion. He has shown that yes. in the past, he but he's also shown he's not amenable to force. Yeah. So why do we keep on avoiding the logical answer, which is to negotiate and bring down the tension, and we keep on rationing things up? That's what I, it confounds me. And to go back to the questions of uh, Dylan and Chris like, about U.S. involvement here, here's the fun fact. Putin is not concerned about the United States from all that I have read recently about this issue. He doesn't really give 
much of a time attention to uh, President Obama. He is only focused on what the Germans and the French uh, and the British, because London is important as a financial capital for Russian uh, capital in and out. Uh, that's what he is focused on. He couldn't care less about President Obama and what he, President Obama thinks. And so if we can ratchet up whatever we need, whatever we can, uh, and whatever we wish to, but I doubt if it's going to have much of an effect, unless the Europeans are going to uh, do even more, which they have done. And so as Tom said, that has been having much more effect than the American stuff. And it's harder for them because yeah, they got more they are, But it seems like Angela Merkel is finally getting, turned around. Yeah, getting more <laughs> out of it. It's a German part yeah, of so. Yep. So, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what this, this means for Putin's response, but um, yeah, he, he, I don't know. You can't kidding? solve it right here, right now? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? We can't solve it right here, right now? I just yeah, feel like we, we, we have 10 minutes to solve it. He, I don't know, I feel like neither side really wants to threaten. There's no, um, you know, they have no agenda to dominate the other side. They, you know, Putin does not want to invade Poland, for example. You know, he doesn't even want to invade, you know, Western Ukraine. He, you know, he might want the little eastern parts of the Russian populations. I think that's as far as he wants to go. Um, and, you know, NATO doesn't want to invade Ukraine. NATO doesn't want to invade Russia. I mean, that, it's... Oh, why do we even have NATO at this point? That's, yeah. <laughs> when I was reading some of the articles... We have NATO because Putin's moving. He's doing this. Putin has brought it back to life, which but is the, scary. But the whole idea so. of the military alliance was to offset the, the Soviet bloc. The Soviet bloc's gone. We could have dissolved NATO and, you know, just gone about our business. The fact that NATO exists, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting closer to Russia's borders, you know, you know as you said at the beginning, it is threatening to... To Russia, and it is going to make them feel paranoid. If you go to any politician now, they're going to say more sanctions. Yeah. We can't. We have to be tough. We can never be tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher, and that's not going to end this. It's no. Not. no, it's, it's not. It, but it, what politician is going to come out talking about negotiations? You know, for the Hitler Chamberlain thing, which always comes out. You, you can't talk. You can't be reasonable. It's Hitler. You know, this because well that may, maybe that was one isolated situation in history where we had a psychopath leading a country that was controlled by other psychopaths. Maybe when you're dealing with a nation like so we keep saying it, Russia, um, maybe we can he's not Hitler. I doubt he's Hitler. I haven't seen him putting anyone in death camps yet. So yes. he's, he's, a, he's assassinated many of his enemies. Yes. He was cold bloodedly killed with his opponents in different ways. Dylan, what do you think? How do you think the West should, so now that we know, we have some thanks, but uh, what's your suggestion for the West to do in this situation? What do you think we should do? I mean, I wouldn't have liked to see us not get involved in the first place, but it goes back to the superpower thing, like you were saying. We're there, you're not going to back off because that shows weakness. So once we're there, I feel like we're very committed to it, in a sense, and we have to just keep going with it as much as it's going to stink for us. We just have to sit this one out and be there, and whatever the effects are, I feel like we have to be ready to face. As far as even going to war? Because then, you remember, when you go down this road, you have to say that you will go down all the way. And all the way is on conflict with Russia. I think uh, it would be great if the U.S. keep ratcheting it down, and then the EU is like, oh, we have U.S. backing, and then they step up, because like you said, he only cares about what the EU leaders think. So I think U.S. is trying to take a lead role like we always do, but I feel like ideally there'd be a certain point where we just kind of pass it off to the EU, not that I think we should be passing off problems like that, starting problems and giving it to someone else, but I think... That would be a best way out option if there's such thing. I don't think the U.S. should go to war at this point. However, the tensions rising are kind of leading to that. But like I said, I'd rather see the EU step up and be the EU. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, I think that the United States really, we should always like keep an eye out and be ready for whatever happens. But I think in this instance, we just need to let it go and not be involved. We need to back out a little bit. Because no war is worth it at this point. I mean, we've, we've 
we've seen so many throughout history. I don't, I don't think we need another one between. And we have the Cold War. Nothing happened this time around. I don't, you know, I don't want to see the war if it did get to that point. It would be more than we anyone needs to deal with. I was going to say the the impression from these articles is that nobody is anticipating going to war over the Ukraine. We could take the whole country, we're, we're not going to go to war. Where we do have to go to war is if you invade a NATO ally, so if you invade Poland or one of the Baltic states, then we're you know, kind of obliged or committed to, to defend them. So that, I mean, that's what makes the whole thing kind of a sham and a farce, is that Putin knows he can do whatever he wants. We're not, he's not going to get invaded. We're not, we're not, you know, we could arm Ukraine, we could give some weapons, give them military training. You know, American soldier, you know, the boots of an American soldier are going to touch Ukrainian soil, but for this over Ukrainian issue. So so he you know so it's up to him how how daring he wants to be in terms of taking chunks of uh, this country. But I think all he has to fear is sanctions. And, you know, so look what we've done by not negotiating. We put in our sanctions and we waste how much power capital on this because he's gonna do what he's gonna do anyway. Well but we're so gonna we'll they're, right with it. Everyone's setting up for negotiations though. His military moves are to give him leverage for negotiations. Our sanctions are give us leverage for negotiations. Well, I mean, he, he, I don't know, I just saw this in the news two hours ago, that I forget where he was, he was visiting some country, and he got off the plane with a, some notes on a notepad saying, here are my eight suggestions for negotiating side of this. So he's, he's kind of already laying out a kind of peace plan. For the camera with a smiley face. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, be a good guy. <laughs> so I think ultimately he wants to be in strong power to negotiate the kind of outcome he wants and to get the sanctions taken off of him. And maybe he wouldn't have negotiated if he, the sanctions were pressuring him. Yeah, the sanctions are pressuring him because they are very targeted. Um, and uh, one of the funny things, with respect to what you said about the eight, eight uh, demands and suggestions he had, is that he gives them, and then he also tells his troops to kind of get closer to Ukraine. <laughs> the other day, last week, he was having a, a talk with Poroshenko, the U Ukrainian Prime Minister, and while they're having a talk, and talking about how to solve this, at the same time, he was telling his troops to go over. So, you know, he has this, it's very hard to understand this man, he, he looks very, you know, uh, he looks very difficult to understand, but he has this two-track system going on, so sometimes when you're dealing with a person like that, it's very difficult to decide how should we tackle this person. And uh, to go back to the, what Dylan and Chris said, that we should stay out of this, it's too late for us at this point. It's too late, and that's what is kind of called like what we call as like brinkmanship. That means once you reach the brink, you can't pull yourself back. Because now, if you pull ourselves back, that's amazing show of weakness. Already, he doesn't believe that the U.S. is as strong as it is. It is portraying itself. So he's, and then he thinks that the EU has a very divided foreign policy, which is actually very true. Uh, but so you know, if we pull back now, there's no way back. Now at this point, without completely telling not just Putin, but also the rest of the world that we are really weak. Here you go, do whatever you want. <laughs> and we are also signaling to, again I go back to my signaling thing, not just to Putin, we are signaling to the rest of the world that they can board bullies and they will not do anything about it. Right, because doesn't China have, yeah. have uh, Territorial ambitions. claims on islands in the vicinity? It has claims on almost every country around it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, and uh, yeah. But this time it's so, uh, to wrap this up, uh, how would you see this situation? Uh, let's start this time from Tom, on this side, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think? Is it going to be a new Cold War? Is it going to be, you know, uh, unfortunately a real war? Or what, what's your take? Uh, I, don't see, I, I don't see how it could be a Cold War, because the Cold War was about two superpowers who had global reach and global ambitions, and it was a struggle for world domination, basically. So Russia can't be an opponent in a, cold, in a second Cold War because they're not powerful really enough. They, they are really much weaker than we are. And their economy is not that strong. The military is you know, kind of in shambles. Uh, they're stronger than Ukraine, but they, they don't want to take us on militarily. And they can't operate around the globe. We're the only, we're the only nation in the world that has fleets in all the major oceans and military bases in all the continents. So they'll be, it'll be like Iran, it'll be just a chronic festering 
you know, a source of tension and, and, and annoyance for us. But I don't see it being a Cold War. Well, again, we'll have bad relations with Russia, but I would call it a Cold War. Uh, I, don't, I agree with you on this. I don't, you don't have to mash the public yeah. this point. Uh, but I don't think it will be, if we handle this right, I think it would be a situation where we can get along with Russia. Yeah, I'm not saying it's inevitable. Right. <laughs> I think it has to be handled right. You have to understand that other countries have egos, that other countries have nationalist feelings. And anytime you have a negotiation, both parties have to walk away from it, feeling they got something. And we've got to get away from our thing of dominance and it's us, because that will never work. So if we're clever enough to sit down and have him have his pride, which is very important, and Russian pride, and work out for all parties, that could happen, but I don't, I'm not that optimistic about that. I might have a table things in the past. Billy? Um, it's, a, it's a very precarious idea. You were talking about it very lightly, but I, I just feel like massive conflicts start from such little things that we yeah. are involved. You're right. We need to keep an eye on it at this point. I wish we could just back out, but it, you're right, we're, we're too far past it. And the whole thing we've shown weakness, I, I'm not a really big advocate for it, and I feel like we should be able to show weakness. We, I, I don't think we should be in a place where, in a world, this is a personal thing, but we should be in a world where your power is everything, it means everything, you're not gonna, if you show any slightest weakness, you're gonna be coming under attack. I don't like that, but back to the point, um, I, I just feel that it's not going to come to a head, but we need to be wary of it because it so easily could turn into a huge conflict and then and we get it and do it before we even know what happens. It just kind of frightens me a little bit. It's definitely worth yeah, paying more attention to it. I like Bill's line that uh, just like how hypocrisy is a sign of a superpower, uh, to show weakness <laughs> and to live with it is a sign of a Sometimes you're wrong. Yeah, it, I, yeah. I just, it, it's all the that we can't. It can't be. It, you're right. If we do show weakness, then a lot of other countries are going to start to take advantage. But it, why does it have to be like that? It's such an annoyance because it, <laughs> it's give in to something and let it go, and things are a lot easier. I don't know. I, I have to laugh because Obama at this point can't even wear a tan suit without being accused <laughs> of weakness. What was their family day? Uh, uh, to go off what you were saying, I feel like uh, I agree. I feel like it should be able to show weakness, but I feel like uh, Obama's not willing to do that given the past <laughs> decade, basically, of our foreign policy. But I don't, I will agree with you two as well. I don't think it's going to amount to a uh, Cold War 2.0. I feel like it's just going to be rising tensions. It's not going to be as a war. It's going to be just tensions rising and rising, but nothing really coming of it. I feel like a resolution where uh, you know it'd be a great outcome where we have good relations or at least better relations with them is not ever going to happen with Russia at this point. But I would like to see us just kind of. Come out even. I feel like Russia, no matter what, is not going to try to get enough Crimea. But it'll be interesting to see what if we decide to win Crimea, what we'll get back from them. So I feel like that's one of his strong points, and I'm going to be looking forward to see what kind of resolution they come out with. Uh, what we did in the 1990s after the end of the, the Cold War to create some some kind of a connection between the West and and uh, Russia. In my opinion, that has created such an interdependent system that it's very difficult for Russia to get back into a Cold War situation with the West, whether we want it or not. So that is something that, even though it just lasted 10 years, or 12, 14, 15 years, whatever we trying to create that uh, interdependencies, that is so good that it's unthinkable now for these two sides to go into a Cold War. But having said that, so I don't really believe that it's going to be, as I, as I told uh, Jesse, 
when she, uh, she asked me about this last week. So I don't think it's going to be a core war 2.0, exactly like how 1.0 was, but I think, unfortunately, we kind of blew uh, a golden chance to create a different, when I say we, I don't mean the United States, I, meant, I mean the whole world. We, both Putin and us, kind of blew it, it to create a completely different relations with, with, with Russia. Probably because after a while, we started thinking, and just like President Obama said, we started thinking of Russia just as a regional power. And many scholars have noted that we haven't given Russia the, yes, Russia lost the Cold War, but we should have handled Russia a little more, with, with a little more respect. Um, that's our mistake. And Russia's mistake is that it should have acted a little more like a world leader and not like a sulking loser. <laughs> So there are you know, mistakes on both ends, but I think we have unfortunately entered a new normal, as I would call it, where it's going to be a very frosty, very distrustful relationship. Unless we have new leadership that comes in and changes the whole thing. Um, yeah, so we don't want a leader who dictates to each other on both sides. Putin doesn't dictate, but we know what he, how he thinks about the West. And we don't want a leader on any of the you know, European or American leaders who tell Putin and Russian how they should be because they don't take their own life. Because that then they start feeling like, oh, we are the losers of this first Cold War. That's why they are talking to back to us like that, talking to us like that. And so if we can try to get back that power, then these people will start talking to us like that, talking down to us like that. So you know the thought process. There are proud people. Everybody's proud, especially one that was a superpower. So to me, it won't be a Cold War 2.0, but I think we have entered a very uncomfortable, unfortunate uh, new normal. Uh, if anybody else wants to add, any audience questions? We have, a, we have two people, three people who are audience. I mean, I think, honestly... Um, Introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello, I'm Neil Andres. Uh, at this point, uh, administrative support for a few of our graduate health programs. Chime in, I think you really have hit on, on a lot of the key elements of why this will continue, which is kind of digging heels in of once, you cross, once you're off the starting block, you're off the starting block. Um, once we're in the race, we're running, and it is ratcheting up. Um, and, the, and there is a grid, as you were talking about, um, is it possible that our involvement is increasing tension. I think there is the heel digging in where uh, you would not be seeing a huge difference, but it's not going to leave the forefront of Putin's mind because there's now American involvement. Um, but we are dealing with a very different world um, from the world for some of us that existed for the majority of our lives. Um, that you are still looking at a global power in Russia, but not a super so I do think that anything near that scale, um, especially the, the, for my memory, the early 80s scale, um, is unapproachable now. Um, and there, I, optimism reigns for me. <laughs> um, as there's ratcheting up, uh, I think if there is a chance to come to some agreement that really can newspaper headline um, if we can both step out with something that really can, you know, can lead without leaving, um, that relations could return to the late 90s relations, uh, which were really remarkable for someone whose life was the Cold War, you know, sting songs of, you know, I hope the Russians love their children too, <laughs> level of divisions, and, you know, like it, of this world where that where any relation seemed impossible um, outside of kind of active youth, um, I think it's it's possible to return to that. I guess this would be a good time to uh, thank everyone.